welcome, welcome, welcome. Day two of uh, Team Fest. Um, we're going to get started uh, a couple minutes earlier than the inside stage uh, because we've got um, more panelists here and I really wanted to dig in as deep as we possibly can. Uh, start off with just introductions. Um, I'm David Heikinen, Head of Research uh, and Insights at Pickering Energy Partners. Um, Marty, do you want to just introduce yourselves and then we'll just kind of dig in? Yeah, uh, I'm Marty Bent, founder of TFTC.io, a media company focused on Bitcoin. Freedom and beauty in the digital age. I also am a venture partner at 1031, a VC firm focused on Bitcoin uh, inv investments in the Bitcoin infrastructure space, and I sit on the board of directors at Cathedra Bitcoin, which was formerly Fortress Technologies. Max Gagliardi, I'm the co-founder and partner of Ancova Energy, or the Ancova Group of Companies. We've got a energy marketing business, uh, midstream arm, and then we also just started Ancova Digital, which is our B Bitcoin platform. Uh, co-founder and CTO of Hotel Range, and Jesse Peltan. Uh, we're company focused on developing Bitcoin infrastructure in West Texas because of the huge energy arbitrage between power pricing in West Texas and the rest of the world. All right, so I'm gonna get a, a show of hands if these three fellows are a 10 out of 10 on understanding Bitcoin and energy. Uh, who's above a five? Raise your hand. All right, so let's start out at the very, very beginning of energy in, Bitcoin out. Uh, just kind of walk through the process. Maybe Marty, just like the very quick overview of 101 level, and then really wanted to get into the grid and why Texas is really becoming the dominant uh, provider. So the people here can understand how you know gas, gases and, and renewables are getting converted into uh, a store of value um, and really creating real value with spare capacity. Yeah, um, so how does Bitcoin mining work? Bitcoin is a distributed ledger. You have a distributed consensus mechanism where you have players all around the world trying to come to agreement on what's actually happening on the ledger at any given point in time. Uh, and the way Bitcoin does this is, is via its proof of work mechanism, which is based off of a cryptographic function known as Hashcash SHA-256. Uh, and so how is energy involved and why is it involved? You have to prove that you did some work, so you have to uh, solve these hashing, uh, you have to solve this hashing function trillions of times a second, and that takes a lot of electricity. Uh, over the first 13 years of Bitcoin's life, that, that process has become very specialized. So you have these ASIC computers, uh, they do one thing and one thing only, they solve this hash function. Um, and the fact that you have millions of machines doing this around the world takes a lot of energy. And so as it's gotten more specialized, it's taken more energy to produce these hashes that allow you to add blocks of transactions to the Bitcoin network. Um, and by doing that, miners get rewarded in Bitcoin. So that is the carrot on the stick. They, they use a bunch of energy, create a bunch of hashes, allows them to add blocks of transactions to the network, and then they get rewarded for that work in Bitcoin. And so the name of the game is to drive your energy. And down. so the the SHA-256 algorithm, or really the is a crypto code and you can go online and type in TTTT and get a hash out of it if you're curious. But essentially it, it takes about 10 minutes for each hash. Uh, they design the network as more capacity is added to kind of bring it back to a hash rate is what you'll hear. And so as you're mining the total 21 million coins out that are available, um, as more and more capacity gets added, you know, there's more and more value that's getting into the blockchain. So think about electricity in is actually people are paying money for that and then you're getting a value out. And so think about that as like why why the network as the market market cap of Bitcoin keeps going up as more people you know are mining, you're essentially adding more and more electricity to this chain. Uh, is my simple view of uh of when it creates like the reason why we're doing this or the reason why it's consuming the energy is because it's creating a trustless system. So you're expending this, uh, this energy and getting this reward back. And it's almost like a capitalistic way of upholding a network where you don't have to have an Amazon with AWS or like a centralized player upholding the network. A bunch of independent capitalists are upholding the network and they're doing it because they're getting rewarded and they're getting compensated for doing so. So it's the mechanism that allows for having a network that you don't need anybody governing it, the market or the free, almost capitalistic animal spirit of Bitcoin governs it. Yeah, the way the hash function works, like you know if somebody produced that hash, they had to do some work and can prove it mathematically. So it's the fairest way 
to come to this, again, asyn asynchronous distributed consensus? I think, I mean, to distill this down, if you look at, you know, traditional ledger systems, typically you've got somebody who is keeping the record of that ledger. And you have this problem of when you have a network where there's no person in control, how do you decide what's the next entry that goes into that ledger? So what proof of work, all it's doing is it's aligning incentives between the miners and the, like, the, the users of the network. So you can propose data to get added to the ledger, but it's only going to get accepted if there's valid proof of work behind it. So you have to, that's a proof that you expended energy. So if you propose blocks that are bad and the network rejects them, they had invalid data in them, then it actually had to cost you something to do that. So you can't just spam the network for free in a proof of work system. So, and then on, you know, on the converse of that, because you have this alignment of incentives, miners are then rewarded for the energy that they're expending. And this creates a lot of very interesting incentives from an energy perspective for energy innovation, where Bitcoin miners have different incentives than traditional industry. Like traditional industry, you know, aluminum smelters, steel producers, there's a lot of different industry that uses a lot of energy, but most other energy intensive industry has a lot of other material input costs, location siting is very important. Bitcoin miners can go anywhere. They don't have they don't they don't have the same sort of you know, contracts that obligate production. It's just a matter of opportunity cost. So a Bitcoin miner, they can go any location. They can turn off in seconds at any moment to balance supply and demand in the grid. They, they provide a lot of differentiated value to power grids that other types of industry haven't traditionally been able to do. Yeah, and later on today, um, you'll actually, we have a business development person from NRG coming in that, you know, he will talk a lot about demand management and what, what I think will be key in, 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 in our solar and wind panel yesterday, you heard the comment of rationing in South Texas if you can only run at 80% of capacity factors, or if you draw a line kind of across Austin through Fort Worth, everything west of that that is renewable is rationed down. So imagine you're underwriting a power plant and then ERCOC comes and says, you can only run 60% of the time. Well, that other 60% of the time, you now have a use case that is essentially what Jesse and, and these guys are talking about, uh, where you can capture that wind and create a, a, something that can be converted into value. I think a, a lot of people, whenever I talk about Bitcoin, get caught up in the volatility of price. And so I'd, I'd, I'd separate this from the $47,000, $55,000, $69,000, $3,000. And think about it more as like you have this underutilized asset that now has a use case that can convert into something of value. Otherwise, it's a negative value. Like because you've invested the capital in a wind farm, a solar farm, a gas fired power plant, hydro, wherever or whatever it is, and you get rationed back because there isn't demand, then that has a negative NPV on that project. Now you have a source of demand that can flex and basically improve the reliability of the system. So, so for this conversation, it might be helpful to separate the trading value. I own Bitcoin, it goes up and down a lot. It's gonna generally, I think, go up over time. You ought to have a couple percent position in it is my personal opinion, because it's non-correlative and dis decentralized. Um, and there are the Bitcoin maximalists that say you should have everything in it. Yeah. Um, Why so but, British? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> I also own a couple of positions in carbon, but we can talk about that. If you don't know any of that, you're, you're bearish on carbon. Um, but Jesse, I thought it'd be helpful. You know a lot about ERCOT. You've been, I mean, what's interesting as well is your, your kids, and I'm not trying to say like Jesse is 25 years old, but like my kids are really interested in this. And so if you're an oil and gas guy or gal, like this is something that they actually will like immediately resonate around. And you can have like real conversations about what you do for a living uh, is probably the only other plug of why you ought to sit in here and at least understand something about it. And finally, if you ever need to run from the law, I mean, it's probably the best way to run from the law other than physical gold. Um, so those are like my two use cases of the, the holistic, your kids are gonna like it. And then if everything goes wrong, you know, you can have your, your wallet and like actually go anywhere in the world and find someone that'll uh, trade you for it. So Jesse, talk some about ERCOT and get us back on track if you would. Yeah. So. I came to Bitcoin from an energy perspective. I think that, um, that the energy angle is the most interesting angle for me about Bitcoin. I, think, I mean, there's other really interesting angles about the humanitarian aspects and, and so forth. But from an energy perspective, Bitcoin mining has an ability to change the way that we think about grids. So, for example, 
Texas has had a massive boom in renewable energy. And renewables, they're a great resource. There's a wealth of energy. Texas has more renewable potential than any other state in the nation from both a wind and a solar standpoint. But renewables bring a lot of problems. They bring their intermittent power generation. If you look historically, the way the power grids work is you have this base load production that's just overproducing most of the time. You have people's consumption that's fluctuating wildly on a, in an hourly basis. And the, you would turn on your light and the, the grid has to be ready to essentially turn that on right away. But when you throw a bunch of intermittent power production, what's happening is now you have this load that is varying and now you have the supply that's varying and that doesn't work from a power grid standpoint. The power grid, you have to be perfectly matched at 60 Hertz all the time. Otherwise you can put additional strain on generators, generators trip offline. And that's what we saw in the winter storm where you had a bunch of, of gas generation that tripped offline because the grid frequency dropped. And there are only a few ways you can solve this. You either have to put additional power onto the grid. So you have to have standby capacity, whether that's natural gas peaker plants or that's you know, uh, diesel generators or whatever else, just ready to go and put power on the grid at any moment. That's not a very efficient system because those things run at super low utilization factors, very inefficient type of generation. You can have, you know, some batteries can help out with this somewhat, but there's not nearly enough battery capacity to do all of this. But the, the most economically efficient way to do this is you need to shift load. And Bitcoin miners can be one of the most responsive ways to shift load. I mean, the Bitcoin network, you've got over 10 gigs of power consumption worldwide. If you compare demand response with a large Bitcoin mine versus trying to aggregate tens of thousands of Nest thermostats in people's houses and deprive people of air conditioning on the hottest day of the summer, like the Bitcoin mine is going to be significantly, a significantly more palatable solution to balancing the grid. And it's, you know, it's not just about Bitcoin mining. There's a lot of other stuff that needs to be load shifted. But Bitcoin mining, I think it, it helps show that that is a viable path and direction to be able to integrate these renewables into the grid and actually make useful, uh, like you, you have useful utility out of the power that's being produced. There's way more wind and solar in Texas than we could ever harvest. I mean, NREL did a study on this in uh, 2012 looking at the amount of sun and the amount of, of wind electricity that Texas could produce. From a wind standpoint, we could produce more electricity than is consumed in all of North America. From a solar standpoint, we could produce more electricity than is consumed in the world. So we could never harvest all of the wind and solar that exists here in the state. But there's a huge difference between there's energy there that exists and making useful, like, making useful work out of that energy. That there's like wind and solar are great sources, but they're just not sources of capacity. They're not dispatchable. It's just, it's not the same thing as natural gas or nuclear, but there is a great wealth of resources there that we can utilize. Yeah, now just kind of segueing it to, to get to Bitcoin in the oil field. So you have this overlay of you know, where oil fields are, where wind and solar is, but then I'll give you a use case that I was meeting with a large Bakken producer and they had uh, some acreage on Fort Berthold and essentially one of the surface right landowners wouldn't allow them to put a, a gas pipeline in. Um, so they put a JT cooler on and actually installed a Bitcoin mine. So they're now producing a four well oil pad, 8,000 barrels a day, you know, pulling the condensate off and mining Bitcoin. And it's a large US independent that no one would actually know. They, they monetize it daily. But I think Marty, you could probably talk some about your, your background. I actually met you guys a and heard about you in 2019, I think, and you've been doing it for a while. So talk about how you how you started and kind of where you see this going. Yeah, uh, so one of my favorite ways to describe Bitcoin miners was uh, uh, is an idea by a man named John Seth who describes Bitcoin miners as energy pirates. We're, we're pirates on the open seas looking for the cheapest uh, energy that we can find, the cheapest electricity. And uh, when, we were at, when I was at Great American Mining, what we stumbled into uh, was flared gas. Uh, we were we were actually at, in the summer of 2019. We were at a point where we were actually going to close up shop. Todd Garland, the CEO, gave our engineers like a six-week ultimatum. He's like, "All right, guys, this is getting too expensive. Figure out how to make this happen, or we're gonna we're gonna shut the doors." And our engineers, uh, our what our head engineer Reet was at a state fair in Utah and he was talking to a buddy in the oil and gas industry. He's like, Hey, I've got this water treatment facility. We're just flaring a bunch of gas. 
do you want to come on site and use this for your electricity? He's like, well, actually. Um, and so that's when we built our first container and deployed it. We're like, holy crap, uh, there's something here. And so essentially what we do, again, we're uh, miners trying to drive our all-in cost of electricity down as low as possible. And what provides off-grid miners on the oil field that opportunity is this flare gas that has no ability to get to market. There is either no pipeline capacity um, uh, or there's just there's uh, too much gas to take into a pipeline. Uh, and so we show up and we say, hey, don't flare that. We'll buy it from you for X amount, which drives our price of electricity down to a profitable area and we'll take care of your, your flaring problem. So what does that look like on the oil field? We show up with generators. Uh, we we uh, do the piping on site. So depending on the BTU content of the gas, we'll uh, hopefully don't have to put one in, but we can put in scrubbers, bubble towers, all that, uh, treat the gas before it goes into gen sets. And it's pretty simple from there. You just create electricity on site, you plug it into a container filled with miners, and they produce hashes uh, that allow us to, to mine Bitcoin. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be integrated throughout oil and gas uh, operations within the next decade. I, I have a thesis that energy companies, oil and gas companies being a part of that are going to be some of the largest miners in the world. And that is because you guys are at the source of the molecule. And so you're incentivized, you're most incentivized to, to be mining Bitcoin because you have the lowest cost of, of energy acquisition. So from an audience standpoint, and you can actually ask your text questions, but I'm gonna, there's two paths we could go on. And so raise your hand on path one, path two. The path one is we could go down the path of you're an upstream company, you're a midstream company, you're a power producer. How do you think about where we should site a mine? What is the logic of it? Like, where do you install it? Who do you talk to? The other path is we could go through and talk through like, okay, what are the cost structure? Like, so if you're taking gas at four bucks, what are you converting that into? What's your capital cost per megawatt? Like, how do you think through that? So raise your hand if you want path one. So we got a few, path two. All right, so we're doing path two. Max, that fits into some of the yeah. stuff you're working on. I think both of those paths kind of in the same, you can answer in the same response. So my background is energy marketing, specifically natural gas marketing. Our company has really been built around this idea of how do we help producers, energy producers get the most value for their product. And so, it, you know, everything we do is effectively transporting energy from where it is produced to where it's needed and trying to maximize the value or minimize the cost, basically. So whether that be pipeline fees, whether that be uh, whatever it may be, the market uh, that you can sell it to. And so with Bitcoin, I think that the interesting thing here is it's the first time really ever in humanity that we can take this large scale and high value demand source for energy and we can move it anywhere in the world. And when you first think about that, you're kind of like, oh, this is, I mean, that's interesting, right? But then if you think about it a little deeper, you start to think, okay, wait a second, this effectively changes everything that I've done for my career and what our company has built. And so now you can take um, this extremely valuable use of energy and move it where you need it to be. And so I think the cost structures can change. I mean, for example, if you look at natural gas, going into a pipeline, you're paying gathering fees, compression fees, uh, and if you know there's emissions, there's energy loss all the way through to get it all the way to a power plant, then you've got to convert it to electricity, get it on the grid. Um, if you put that Bitcoin mine right there and you generate the electricity right there, you're now cutting out not only a ton of waste in terms of the fuel and all this loss, uh, you're t cutting out a bunch of fees as well. And so um, the ability to then take Bitcoin mining and put it anywhere, it kind of changes effectively uh, the properties of these different plays. So whether it's a natural gas play, whether it's renewables like Jesse talked about, and it, it just, it changes the economics. And what was the first part of that? I'm trying to remember the, the full question. It's kind of getting into like, what are the capital costs? Like it's it's pretty capital intensive. Um, so it's probably talking about, you know, you've got a, your your first site, um, like what's the a dollar per mega or dollar per MCF? Like well, what's the right way to think of uh, it in terms the audience would know? So it depends, I guess that's the, the uh, correct answer because again the, the ASICs so it's very capital intensive and the biggest part of that cost that initial capital outlay is the computers themselves they're very expensive uh, right now like a megawatt worth of machines top of the line are running like S19s or M30 S pluses you're probably in like 
one and a half to 1.7 mil for like a megawatt worth of machines right now. Yeah, I mean, so for new machines today, if you want to get latest, greatest, top of the line, you're going to, if you're paying immediate delivery, probably 3 million per megawatt. If you're doing future delivery, it's about 2 million per megawatt. But one of the great things about if you're using a stranded resource, you have a cheaper cost of power. So you don't have to buy the newest, latest, greatest machine and pay that huge premium that other people need in order to have a margin. So if you're if you're running, for example, if you buy older machines like an Atminer S9, you can get those for about four hundred dollars. You know that's a you know, 1.2 to 1.5 kilowatt machine. So you're closer to the 250 to 300 k per kilo or per megawatt on that. Um, and you, when you're when you're at the lower part of the cost curve, you have way more optionality. So I, I think this is one of the big differences that this is shaking up. I mean. It, it, it has a potential to change the energy space, and it's also absolutely changing in the, the Bitcoin mining space, is that historically all that mattered when there was a new machine coming up every couple months was you buy the newest, latest, greatest machine, you get it, you plug it in, you run it for a couple months. So China absolutely dominated that game. But today, the, the rate of innovation in these computers is much slower. So it's no longer about going and buying a new machine every six months. It's about running a machine for five, 10 years at the lowest cost of energy possible and getting the getting the best amortized cost of compute. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy how how competitive it's getting at the at the minor level in the field. Like all these cost structures, that's like an interesting thing. Like these computers now, the S9, the first batch of S9s went out in what, 2015? June of 2016. 2016, and they're still around today, almost six years later. And so like that's what I think about right now, like M30s, S19s, how long are they going to be on the market? Like six, seven, eight years. And as Jesse said, you can you can play a timing game. So the price of these ASICs are very reflexive to the price of Bitcoin. They track the price of Bitcoin very tightly. So if Bitcoin price runs up, these ASICs are, are, are going to run up as well. And so there's an aspect to that as well as trying to time the markets. You want to buy these ASICs. Uh, like during a bear market, essentially a bear market of Bitcoin, and then deploy them. That is when they're going to get the the highest ROI. Um, that's what we've seen historically. And maybe each we could talk about like a deployment that you've done or, or are doing. Like you, you have different sizes completely, and, and capital requirements and and siting. So that might be helpful just to yeah. scale from small to large. Yeah, I mean, I think like the smallest, and this gets into the power gen side, which we haven't talked about on the cost structure, and that's a huge piece of this, because it's like, what is, you, you've got your raw input, which is the gas, uh, in terms of if you're doing the oil field, but you also have like to generate the power, so you have these different generators. And I think the smallest ones that we've seen or that, we get, that we're doing is 50 kilowatts, so you probably need 13 to 15 MCF a day, uh, and that deployment, even with new gins, probably around a couple hundred thousand dollars to do that deployment on a 50 kilowatt um, gin set. And so if you think about like, for example, in Oklahoma, where I'm from, Oklahoma City, we've got a, in Texas as well, has a lot of old wells that need to be plugged and abandoned. Massive problem, right? So I've been talking with the Oklahoma Energy and Resource Board about creative ways that we can take Bitcoin mining. And if you only need 10 to 15 MCF, you can in theory put these on older wells, generate the power with a small generator, create an economic incentive that then you can use to when that well, it gives it a little extra use life and the state could actually use it to then clean that side up and plug that well. And so you can go from 50 kilowatts with the generator all the way up to turbines, gas turbines that are larger scale. I mean, I think the largest that we're looking at doing are 350 kilowatt generators. Um, it's kind of a sweet spot. I don't know, you may know better on the power side, but it's a big piece of it. I mean, understanding that and managing it, the costs involved, you have to run these generators 24 seven in the oil field. So uh, it's a huge component of uh Yeah, sizing gen sets to an op operation like is a very important part because you want to have some redundancy, right? Uh, you don't want to have one gen set to one container of miners because if that gen set goes down, the whole container goes down. You'd like to size it so you have, again, a little redundancy. If one gen set goes down, maybe you have to shut down a third of your miners and you can keep hashing with, with two thirds of your capacity. But yeah, I mean, it differs from site to site depending on how much you're flaring, what the BTU content is. And, and, yeah, I'm gonna hand this over to you, Jesse, in a second, but it's kind of this rule if you've ever been offshore fishing, you know, you have two motors, that means you have one. If you have one, you have none. Um, and if you've gone off with one motor and it doesn't run, it's it's pretty unnerving. Um, so two is better or one and a half or 1.8 or something along those lines. Can you talk about the project you guys are doing or kind of size and scale and what your sources are and that might be helpful of, like capital and, and uh, scale? Yeah, so from, uh, it depends on what you're trying to deploy here. So for example, like the, the natural gas guys, you're looking at the you know, 
tens to hundreds of kilowatts, maybe a few megawatts. When you're doing more on the grid connected renewable side, you're talking about hundreds of megawatts to gigawatt scale projects. So there's a totally different set of challenges and advantages to that. But uh, that's something that we're at Huddle Ranch very focused on is that just like any sort of traditional data center, there are massive economies of scale to being larger. So that's why you see the traditional data center industry is moving towards hyperscalers to these big you know, multi hundred megawatt data centers. I mean, you have a lot of a lot of your cost structure, a lot of things, a lot of your costs are fixed. You know, you need 24 seven security, whether you're operating $10 million of equipment or a billion dollars worth of equipment. So you can get some serious economies of scale by going larger. Uh, but there's uh, and there's also a lot of opportunities of, of how to um, how to lower your cost of power further. So, for example, by building your own grid infrastructure, you can reduce the cost of your grid inter interconnect. But it only makes sense to do that if you're doing a big project. So there's a lot of things that that you can't really do at a two megawatt scale or a five megawatt scale. But as you get larger, you can have essentially this is hundreds of megawatts of a virtual power plant where you can balance the grid at significant scale at, at these uh, large grid interconnections. But those are highly capital intensive projects. It's you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, of capital deployed. It seems like the gas side is tens of millions of dollars. Is that the frame? What's the, so um, I guess I, so it, four dollars much gas to spend a lot of money in Bitcoin mining. I mean, the yeah. energy density is like you know, like even that fifty, a thirteen MCF a day project is two hundred something thousand dollars. Right. You know, so you have guys that would be like, I have a couple million a day that I love to mine some Bitcoin with. It's like, well, you better have tens of millions of dollars because we're gonna yeah, and then need it. The, so let's take four dollar gas in or three dollar gas in, fifty thousand dollar Bitcoin out. Uh, what's the payback? Like, how do you think through that? It's going to be dependent on the price you're paying for these ASICs, and so I would say that if you do the cheap source, you're intermittent, so you're you're not running at peak level. You're getting the five seven hundred dollar uh, unit as opposed well, to the well, even if like like us, you guys, if even a gross like say there's no energy cost at all, what's well, like if the gross price payback for these things they usually price them around what ten to fourteen months is kind of like what you pay for yeah. an ASIC. Yeah, I mean the range. Uh, is anywhere from like as, as little as eight to ten months to as long as twenty four months if you're in a bear market um, and you're deploying well, and pay, payback period on the buying the computers. Yeah. Well, and there, there's also a, a really interesting, important nuance to this point of like the way that ASICs are priced is it, an ASIC is such, essentially like it's a cash flow machine. You have a stream of revenue, and then you have some expense that you have to net off of that. And the way that that works is that they're pricing this based on some number of months of forward uh, revenue minus the marginal cost. If you wanted to go host that machine at whatever the marginal site is, so today that's somewhere in the eight to 10 cents a kilowatt hour to go get hosting space. But if you have a significantly lower cost of operations, when the price, when the price goes down because of your operating delta, that machine gets cheaper to you than it does to the rest of the market. So, for example, in 2018, we saw this. Uh, the price of an Antminer S9 fell from $2,000 to $100 when the revenue f got cut in half. So you were making 12 cents before, then you were making six cents. But if your hosting cost was six, seven, eight cents, you lost 100% of your margin. But if you have two cent power, that machine was essentially worth 50% of what it was before, but now it's only 5% of the cost. So one of the really interesting points here is that if you position yourself properly on the cost curve, you can take advantage of the inherent volatility that exists in Bitcoin rather than be wiped out by it. Yeah, and that's like something I'd be interested to describe or discuss with you, Jesse, because like I'm a Bitcoiner, like again, being low on that cost curve, if I have the capital to get like top of the line machines, like would you do that? Like for me as a Bitcoiner, like I want as many sats as possible. Uh, so you're saying, would you purchase the, the top of the line machines or the, the older ones, or could you, could you repeat that? Yeah, so like if I have half a cent a kilowatt hour power. Right? Yeah, I would buy the older machines for sure. The, yeah. the, if, if you look on a per, like per megawatt basis, on a per unit of compute basis, the older machines are much cheaper. They're just, it, it's because they're priced based on those marginal producers. So if you if you can be a little bit longer term in how you think about your operations, like Bitcoin mining historically, you have people that are looking at this on six months to a year. They're looking to just build a very cheap facility, throw machines in there and get a very quick payback. But it, to energy companies, I mean, they think much longer term. And if you come at this from an energy perspective, you can have a really compelling expected value here where you have you have a floored risk on the downside 
but like for, for example here, right, if you're, uh, your revenue as a Bitcoin miner is essentially your percentage of compute power of the total network times the rewards the network gets. So when the price of Bitcoin goes down, not only are these there are cheap machines for you to buy, but the amount of Bitcoin that you get goes up because the high cost producers turn off. So it's it's like like being if you're you know, if you're in oil and gas, you want to be the guy with eight dollar lifting cost and not forty dollar lifting cost. That you could if you position yourself properly, you can you can have a, a much better risk on the downside, where the volatility in Bitcoin price doesn't matter nearly as much as you might think. And then the other part here is on the upside. Like right now, Bitcoin is about 12 gigs net, like worldwide deployed. You know, equilibrium quantity is probably on the range of 20 to 25 gigs. If we see another 10x parabolic move in Bitcoin, so Bitcoin reaching the market cap of gold, the equilibrium quantity of Bitcoin mining is in the hundreds of gigawatts. You're talking about two to 300 gigs. That's three times the size of the peak demand of ERCOT. So now all of a sudden, like if whatever market share you can grab today, you can hold that as it takes years for the capacity to be built out to bring the market into equilibrium. Which is why you'll hear later why NRG is so excited about this as an idea. So imagine now you have a lower capital cost Bitcoin mine that is able to swing down whenever Yuri happens. And so then your wind farm catches the five, seven, nine thousand dollar peak price. But you also, as opposed to spinning down all of our houses, you spin down Bitcoin mines that can turn off like that. And so essentially you have this reliability factor that's built in and it's allowing you to build this long dated, you know, not just your base load, but it actually enables the, the renewable side as well. And so it's this really unique combination of why Texas and Greg Abbott's starting to come around a little bit to this um, of like why Texas actually has this unique market, both from an ERCOT standpoint, but then from a resource. And this is like a beautiful positive externality of the, of the distributed system that Satoshi gave us, right? Like thinking like you can shut down megawatts worth of machines in Texas and the Bitcoin network will keep producing blocks. Like it's, it's a beautiful thing. Well, it's, it's, so then the rest of the Bitcoin network gets the incentive where you take a bunch of hash out. So like then the remaining machines are going to get more of the Bitcoin out. So they maintain the network. It's really this interesting, why I got so interested was it looked like a non-correlative trade, but it actually, Max and I've talked a lot about this. It actually is the enabler for the, for actually the power and, and the energy markets. Um, and it really does change the profile of use cases and there isn't, from a consumer standpoint, we're not going to adopt a case where I can't turn on my light. Like it just, people aren't going to do that. But so you've got to figure out a way to, to have a demand source that is willing to turn off whenever we're not able to. Well, and, and look at, look at this from like, I mean, we've been approached by a number of renewable developers specifically for this reason. What are the three limiting factors to making use of renewables? There's funding to build the projects. There's the fact that the best resources are not in the area where people want to consume them. And there's the intermittency that's, that's created and the volatility in the grid that's created from adding those renewables. As a Bitcoin miner, you directly you can directly address all three of those points. So we can go right to the source where the power is being generated. We create additional revenue for those, for those sources. I mean, for example, here, uh, we're at one of our sites in, in West Texas a few weeks ago. The local nodal pricing for power was negative five cents. So despite the fact that wind turbines could go get a subsidy to put power on the grid, the wind is blowing like crazy. The turbines all have the brakes because it would cost them more energy, more money to put that energy onto the grid than to just shut down the turbine. So there's a massive amount of value that is being lost because there just isn't the capacity to get that power that's being created out of West Texas to where people can consume it. But we can turn the equation on, on its head and it's not just about Bitcoin mining. So Bitcoin mining can be the lead tenant that incentivizes all types of other energy intensive industry to come to West Texas and use this power. We can go there and help stabilize the grid, provide demand, incentivize this build out of additional wind and solar infrastructure in West Texas, but then other types of industrial load can follow. I mean, think like other types of data centers, aluminum smelters, like iron steel manufacturing. There, there's a wealth of resources in this state and we, like right now that the, the infrastructure doesn't exist to be able to properly make use of that. Like these are big, big industrial, like traditional industry needs a, a, a lot of uh, infrastructure to be able to, to run there. But Bitcoin mining can help be that catalyst 
that can enable all sorts of industry to move to an area where you have this wealth of sustainable power. Uh, taking a step back, we do have a question from the audience, so they're slacking them to me. Um, this goes back to now we've got 21 million coins out on a maximum basis. Can you guys just talk through like how Bitcoin's mined, where the halvings happen, like what's the time frame for each of those? When do you get to the point of mm -hmm. 21 million coins? Why do mines keep operating? Those type of... So uh, two milestones this week, a new network hash rate all time high and 90% of all Bitcoin that will ever exist uh, are have been distributed to the market. So the way it works, the way Satoshi set up the supply schedule is there will only ever, there actually will never be 21 million Bitcoin. There'll be a little less than 21 million Bitcoin the way it works out. Um, and so from block, the Genesis block from block zero to block 210,000, uh, there was a 50 Bitcoin block reward. So you had half the 21 million uh, Bitcoin distributed in the first 210,000 blocks. So every 210,000 blocks you have what's called a subsidy halving. So a block 210,000 went from 50 Bitcoin to 25 Bitcoin, then a block 420,000 and went from 25 to 12 and a half Bitcoin, uh, and then a block 630,000, which happened last May, uh, went from 12 and a half Bitcoin to 6.25 Bitcoin uh, per block distributed to the network. And that's where we are now at block uh, 840,000. That'll get cut to 3.125. Um, I hope I'm doing that math right. Uh, but that's... Uh, so that's the way it works. And so 90% of all Bitcoin that will ever be mined have been distributed. The last 10% uh, will take about uh, 120 years to mine. They say 2140 is when the last subsidy will be given out. Uh, but what you have to understand, yes, at, at some point you will be earning a subsidy via the network. But what you have is there are two parts to what we call the block reward. You have the subsidy, which is what was predetermined by Satoshi. Right now, it's 6.25 Bitcoin. Then you have the fees attached to the transactions that you're including in blocks. So that is the reward. It's the subsidy and the fees. And so a lot of people say, oh, when the 21 million Bitcoins mine, like what's going to incentivize the miners? It's the fees attached to the transactions. That'll be the revenue that they're accruing at the end of the day. And I believe it's actually funny being energy, uh, being an energy conference, I believe you can apply Jevons paradox to a Bitcoin UTXO, that UTXO which is actually what a Bitcoin is. It represents. I don't understand anything you just said. <laughs> so an unspent. So when you when you have Bitcoin, you don't really have something called a Bitcoin. You have something called an unspent transaction output that can be used in, as an input and in a like, transaction. It's like accounting, like debits and credits. It's it's, it's yeah. a ledger. So you have the rec the record that that coin was moved. So you have effectively like a debit or a credit. Yes. And that UTXO, you can do things with it. You can write code in it that says, hey, you can only move this Bitcoin if this, that, and another thing happen. And that has inherent utility, which will drive demand, which people are willing to pay for in the form of fees. So that that will be the. Um, the subsidy for the. We haven't even talked about how this is going to change banking yet, but yeah, the yeah. codify. And we don't have time for that. Um, the uh, the codification. So code. Just think about Bitcoin as like a computer that's running two things. It's a store of value program and it's running a currency program. Right now, the store of value program is the predominant value of it. What you're getting to is once you start getting to the point of transactions happening, that's whenever the the second use case comes. And well. Uh, uh, you don't preclude any use case. Right now, store value is the predominant use case, but you can use it as a medium of exchange today. And in the future- This as is the strange thing. So you said this on your recent podcast that you would use Bitcoin to buy a spot at a mining conference because they give you a discount. Like, if you think it's gonna go up 10X, like, isn't that the worst decision you could ever make? Well, that's why you should just take more money and buy more Bitcoin. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what spend I Spend every place. Yeah, and if you're dollar cost averaging Bitcoin, it's actually a life hack because you probably always have some Bitcoin that's out of the money, and if you're spending it, then you can use that as a tax loss, so everything you buy is cheaper because uh, you're using Bitcoin. So if you're dollar cost averaging buying new Bitcoin, you always have some out of the money, you're allowed to write that off. So it's like you're getting a 20% discount on everything you buy if you're using Bitcoin, life yeah. hack. And going right. back to like transactions, like what, what you'll see is Bitcoin's gonna be built out in a layered stack. So you have the protocol layer, which is the settlement layer. It acts more like central banks settling uh, between each other. You're gonna do large transactions there. And then you'll have like your medium of exchange transactions happening at second and third layers. The most famous one right now is the Lightning Network. So for my podcast, the way I monetize that, one of the ways I monetize that is I, I have a Lightning Network address. So it's Bitcoin second layer where I can lock up Bitcoin and send 
Satoshis, which are the smallest unit of a Bitcoin, back and forth to other users, essentially free and have final settlement immediately, whereas at the protocol layer, you have to wait 10 minutes or more usually. Um, but so like to, to highlight, yes, most people are using it as store of value. But every day I can show you my phone now, I have this Lightning Network address in my RSS feed and people can listen to my podcast. And as they're listening, if they're listening on an app that has a Bitcoin wallet in it, they can send me little bits of Bitcoin per minute that they listen if they get value out of the podcast. So maybe define a Satoshi. So there's 100 million Satoshis and one whole Bitcoin. So it's like a cent to a dollar yeah. type comparison. So it's 100 million just for perspective of how small the units are. All right. So we are actually finished. Um, you can corner these guys, um, and I, I actually poked the bear intentionally at the end on uh, on the Bitcoin maximalist. So Marty, I hope you appreciate uh, the tweak there, just to get a little controversy. <laughs> um, but thank you all. Please, I uh, hope you learned something, um, and uh, appreciate y'all uh, participating.